Hello, everyone. Uh, this is Al Fadi, and uh, this is uh, the second episode now of a brand new series that we are going to call Understanding Islam. It's part of a video series that will be launching under a bigger topic called Political Islam. Last time I had my uh, you know, uh, with me here in the studio, uh, a dear brother, a guest uh, speaker, an expert, if you wish. His name is Dr. Bill Warner. Bill laid out a lot of information concerning how Westerners, at least, ought to understand Islam and make a distinction between what they're being told versus the reality. Today, of course, Bill is here with me, and I want you, Bill, uh, first of all, welcome, of course. I want you now to... Uh, explain a little bit more about what do we mean by the term political Islam. Your own ministry is called the right. political, Center for Political Islam. Right. Well, before I read Islamic doctrine, I'd already read Hinduism. I studied Torah at the Orthodox Synagogue. I'd studied the Old Testament, the New Testament. I uh, studied Buddhist sutras. I studied religious texts all of my life. But I came to Islam last. And when I came to Islam, it was like, well, this is very peculiar. Because when you, for instance, let's take a Buddhist sutra. It's how to be a Buddhist. But so much in the Quran was about me, the non-Muslim. In other words, the focus is on outsiders versus the community. Yes. As a matter of fact, yeah. being a scientist, I went through and I, I created a term, I adopted a term called kafir, which I put a capital K in front of. And there are many names for the unbeliever. Right. But in the end, they all get treated the same. And so I said, they need the same name, so I chose the Arabic word kafir. But the amazing thing is, is I counted up, and 51% of the Quran, and the Sirah and the Hadith, we'll get back to that more later, <clears throat> is about the kafir, the non-Muslim. And let me assure you, it is not very pleasant. So repeat again the percentage. <clears throat> By the way, Bill loves percentages. I'm an engineer myself. I love statistics. So you said more than 50%. 51%. Think about it. You read a text, you know, a religious text, and all of a sudden you discover it's devoting more than half of its teachings about you, the non-follower of the religion. And it's not a very pleasant view many times because the Kafir can be enslaved, tortured, raped, killed, deceived. So it's like, I said, this is my problem with Islam. Al, I don't care about the religion of Islam in the sense of I don't care whether Muslims pray five times a day. I don't care, none at all. I don't care if they want to pray to Miami or Mecca. I don't care. I mean, what I care about a religion is what character it creates and what ethics it advocates. So, but I am very interested in what it says about me. And so that's my interest. And I call this political Islam because it is not religious Islam. And also, I coined this term on, in the week after 9-11, and I realized in America, criticism of religion gets you on slippery slope because of the First Amendment protection of religion. But if the political nature of it is discussed, we can still talk politics. And that's all I talk about. The other thing I never talk about, Al, are Muslims. The only Muslim I talk about is Muhammad, the original one. But I never discuss Muslims. I never just say they're good, bad, or indifferent. I just say, this is what they believe, or if they did this, this is why they did it. Or, it's fair to say sometimes, if a Muslim will say something, you can gently say, but that's not what Muhammad taught. Yes. Because simply, uh, as a Muslim, you cannot come, come up with a new vision for, for a religion or a new practice when your primary sources and your primary model did not agree with you, or did not teach it or endorse it. Well, we're left here with the behavior of Muhammad is, shall we say, permanent. That is, what he did is the perfect example for all time. For instance, Muhammad was a slaveholder. We can argue, well, Muhammad was a slaveholder because slavery was part of the culture he lived in. And I agree. But for a Muslim, that is locked in. That is, slavery is therefore, since Muhammad did it, is eternal. Not only Muhammad did it, but how did he treat the slaves? Ah. That's a whole different ballgame, which we will get to that right. later. <laughs> so anyway, so political Islam is the part of Islam that deals with me. And that's what I'm, I want to deal with. And I insist that I have a right to talk about that, just like I have a right to espouse whatever politics I want, as long as it's not direct harm. I say I can talk about Islam. Now, Although this is true, we find here in America that there's increasing pressure to not even discuss not only the religion of Islam, but the politics of Islam. Because some people, when they get into it, realize, 
mm, this is not nice. And so we don't want to be not nice, so we don't discuss the downside of Islam. Yeah, this is the PC culture, of course, that we're yes. living in, you know. Which I despise. It's really, uh, I, I call it voluntary ignorance. That's what you're doing. You want to be an ignorant person voluntarily without any desire to at least learn how to protect yourself. I mean, uh, can you imagine our armed forces, okay, saying, you know, we really don't want to say anything bad about this group or that group, you know. We, we don't care what they do because we're going to look really bad if we try to. Imagine what's going to happen if we've developed this military strategic philosophy after 50 years from now. These groups that we're saying we don't want to do anything with might end up taking uh, advantage of us and ruling us. The same thing with political Islam. Is it your understanding that if you ignore the political side of Islam, that Islam will become dominant? Well, I give evidence for this in history. Let's go through it. Iraq used to be Christian. Turkey used to be Christian. North Africa used to be Christian. Egypt used to be Christian. Pakistan used to be Hindu. Afghanistan used to be Buddhist. And Iran used to be half Christian. Now I ask you, what happened to those countries today? We call them Islamic countries. And there's a reason for that. Right. There, I don't think there's a single Buddhist left in Afghanistan, I'll tell you that. And there's very few left in Pakistan. That's if they're willing to even admit. Right. <laughs> publicly. Right. <laughs> so this is the law of saturation once again. So what we don't want to do is to wait until something gets to the tipping point. We need to plan for it so that we can do better. I had a fire inspector tell me one time, he said, I never saw a fire that when it initially started, you couldn't cover with a dinner plate. And he says, later it may have been an inferno that burned down half the city, but when it started, it was very small. Well, when do you want to deal with the fire? When it's really small or it's consuming the building? Better to deal with it when it's small, and so that's the reason I advocate that we need to study Islam now, today. Absolutely, absolutely. Why don't we um, uh, take a, a quick look, for instance, one of the sources of Islam, and you said you started it with that, has to do with the Quran, for instance. Mm -hmm. And, I, and you, know, you did a, a chart on just describing statistically its content, right? right. So uh, if we can show that chart, it's called the natural division of the Quran, and people can see it here. And, you know, you correctly pointed out that there are two parts of the Quran. One is called the Meccan Quran, and one is called the Medinan Quran. Um, go ahead and elaborate uh, on these, and I will interject uh, right. you know, my thoughts on it. Well, first off, the Meccan Quran is larger, and it is what I call the religious Quran. And we'll get into why I call that later. But it is consists of, first off, a lot of very small chapters. Some of the chapters are only three or four sentences long. That's right, yes. And I must say that some of the Quran's best writing as it's translated into English is found in the Meccan Quran because it has, it's, it has poetic virtue. Now, in the Medinan Quran, it's very political. And become just narratives. Narratives, mm -hmm. yes. But it's also, it, since it includes a great deal of jihad, that's one of the things that's very different. So the Meccan Quran is very different from the Medinan Quran. And let's tell the audience now that we did not invent these terms. That's right. Every Muslim scholar, without exception, agrees that there's two Qurans, would you say? They do. And, and, and I want to clarify what Bill is saying. You know, for instance, let's use the Bible as an example. Uh, we know there is an Old Testament and New Testament. Now, if I give you the Bible, anybody in the world, if I give them a Bible, whether they follow the Bible or not, you start from the beginning and you end, you can see the section division easily, and you can see a narrative story, a meta-narrative, if you wish, from the beginning to the end. Somehow you can explain to me what you've noticed. It, it becomes clearer that there is a plan. Did you notice this in the Quran? No. Why not? Well, because one thing follows the other in the most bizarre fashion. And sometimes what's what they call chapter, which the technical name is surah, contains all kinds of subjects. It's not just devoted to one subject. And it jumps from subject to another. Right, it jumps to a subject, and you also realize that what happened to time? There's no time in the Quran that you buy, what I call the one at the bookstore. Now, what's interesting is, is that we know that it lay, was laid out in time. Every Muslim scholar agrees that the Quran was a process of gradual revelation. Over the course of 23 years, at least. the course of 23 years. Yeah. So the first half, that took 13 years to do, but when you open up a Quran, like when you open up a Bible, here's the Old Testament, here's the New Testament. I mean, it's built right into it. But when you read the Quran, it's like, 
Quran and Syria, I mean, I'm sorry, but Mecca and Medina are all mixed up in the bowl. It's like a salad. And that was the point I was trying to make. If I give you a Quran, there is no such thing as this section is Mecca, this section is Medina. They're intermixed together. In fact, some scholars like Norliki, by the way, did a study and he actually believes one verse can contain both parts. One half Mecca, one half Medina. I mean, th those are scholars that study it, you know, mm -hmm. based on the uh, structure of the sentence and things like that and certain phrases. But that's how convoluted it can be. But this is easily fixed. Since you mentioned Noldecki, he laid out as a good scholarly fashion, this is what the time sequence was. The chronological Quran, yes. Right. So you can easily make a, chron a chronological Quran. I mean, it's you can take, if you have the Quran on a word processor, you can create a chronological order of the Quran in less than an hour's time. Now, you mentioned previously that you regret, or or maybe maybe regret is a tough word. You, 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 like you wished you didn't start with the Quran, and you wish yet you started with the Sira or the biography right. of Muhammad. Now, you, regardless, you did both. Right. If you organize the Quran chronologically, can you see the life of Muhammad in there? Well, it turns out you can. As a matter of fact, the, I produce a Quran which is in chronological order, but I do one more thing. I bring Muhammad's life into it. So that you, here's an example. When you're reading the Quran the first time, you run across a verse which says that it was okay to burn the palm trees. And you're like, palm trees? Who's palm trees? What, what, what are we talking about here? Why are we burning anything? But, and the day that verse was revealed, it was not confusing to any Arabs at all because Two weeks before the verse was revealed, Muhammad had attacked some Jews, couldn't drive them out of their forts. They were date palm farmers, so he cut down the palm trees to spite the Jews. And the Arabs said, that you have violated war law. You don't burn crops. So now then, Allah speaks, steps in. steps in and says, no, it was okay to do that because what they had done to you was worse. So if you integrate the two together, Every Quran verse has a context. So there, there is exactly, that's what we call the reason for the revelation. Yes. Begins to shed a spotlight on the action itself. Right. Absolutely, you know. So, so once you take the Quran and you integrate Muhammad's life into it and you put it in the right time sequence and select similar topics, for instance, one of the things that wears you out about the Quran is it's so repetitive. I think the story of, Maha of Moses is told 38 times. Abraham, multiple times. Uh, again you know. and again and again. And oh, yeah. not Noah again. <laughs> <laughs> so if you collect all these similar topics, the Quran then becomes very easy to understand. But I still say this, it is better to start with the life of Muhammad because it's such an easy read because the difficult one, which is the original document, has now been made by many people such as myself, an easy book to read. And it is a great read. And by the way, here's my criteria in studying the, in writing my books. I want them to be so they could be understood by a high school student. As a matter of fact, when I finished The Life of Muhammad, I paid a, a high school student $20 to read it. Labor's cheap if you're that young. And she could easily understand it. So the work has been done to make The Life of Muhammad easy to understand. And I guarantee you this, if you will read The Life of Muhammad, it will forever change your view of Islam. Right. And by the way, uh, Bill mentioned the life of Muhammad, of course, and you had uh, written something on that uh, from Ibn Ishaq. And, you know, then the student of Ibn Ishaq, Ibn Hisham, did even a massive work, actually. However, you can find simplified versions like the one Bill did. So I encourage you to do that because you really don't want to read every, you know, nick and gra uh, granny, and uh, you don't want to go through details that sometimes don't mean anything to you. Well, one of the chapters in the Sarah, for instance, yeah. is a listing of names. Well, that's kind of boring, like reading a flight manifest. Right. So, uh, but I mean, that's an excellent, you know, uh, uh, point that you made. But let me interject more. If we can show the slide one more time, uh, I want to now uh, bring in my background into this. The reason why it's called Mecca, as Bill mentioned, it was revealed during the period when Muhammad was in Mecca, about 13 years, give or take. It is, by the way, that section of the Quran that sometimes you find our Muslim friends, whether knowingly or unknowingly, quoting from there and saying, you see, it's a religion of peace. Look what it says. But the sad reality is this. When Muhammad migrated from Mecca to Medina after 13 years because of supposedly hostility towards him and the Meccans forced him out, and we started what we call the Islamic calendar at that time, he went to Medina and in there, 
the everything reversed. Now there is hostility towards his enemies. Now there is the doctrine of jihad being emerged. And there is another piece that sometimes our Muslim friends, either they know that it exists or they don't know that it exists. Teachings that are found in the Medinan section, Bill, have canceled what ah, existed. The abrogation. The abrogation. We haven't dealt with that yet. Absolutely. So we want people to be aware of that. Well, Bill, I mean, it seemed like, you know, uh, every time we think like we're going to cover one topic, it seemed like we're just digging deeper into, <laughs> you know, uh, the, 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 the introductory part of things. So uh, next time, maybe we should revisit the trilogy and continue with yes, our discussion. So thank you so much as always. And thank you to all of you until we meet again next episode. Have a blessed day. Thank you for watching. Please like our video. And we encourage you to subscribe to our YouTube channel, Sierra International. And be sure also to click the bell so that you receive notifications whenever we upload new videos into the channel. And finally, I like to prayerfully encourage you to become a patron through Patreon. Your giving is much needed and will enable us to produce more and more of videos like this so that we can publish them on a weekly basis. So thank you in advance.